Most of us walk around every day dragging our chains around. Even if we think God has saved us, we often worry about whether we've done enough or do enough to please Him. We weigh ourselves down or others put more weight on us to do better, try harder, do these things, don't do these things. It's exhausting and can lead to feelings of despair or pride if we're really one of those good people. But the gospel can free us in every way, in every aspect. The good news of Jesus Christ frees us to live with confidence in the midst of uncertainty, brings unity in the midst of strife, and delivers joy in the midst of suffering. There's no other gospel like it. Good morning. My name is Nancy Fleck, and I'm a member of Redemption Christian Church. Uh, this morning, the reading is from Galatians chapter 4, verse 21, through chapter 5, verse 23. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I am trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. 
So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this, this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. This is from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Nancy. I really appreciate Nancy doing this. It's kind of neat to uh, have her up here because she was a part of us in the very first uh, place we met pr pretty much in the theater. When we moved over to the theater, she was there in the early days when we were called Christian Church of Jasper long before uh, redemption, and she's been with us all this time, a long time. Neat to have her up here reading today. Plus, I gave her so many verses again. It's like, you know, I turn those in to the 500,000 word challenge, and we're halfway there, right? I mean, that's a lot, a lot of reading. Appreciate her taking the time to read that text today. Um, for the past few weeks, we've been studying the book of Galatians which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the church in a region known as Galatia, somewhere around uh, modern-day Turkey. And so that's what we've been looking at, and we're going to continue that today. So if you want to open up your Bible to Galatians chapter 4, we're going to look at the verses that were just read to you. Uh, if you don't have a device or a Bible, you can go to page 702 in the church Bible there, and we're going to be breaking down that, that down and looking a little bit. But as we're getting there, as you open up there, maybe it'd, it'd take a little mo moment to to kind of review for us because um, I need reminders and you need reminders and many of you may be this your first time here during this series and you're trying to jump in. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on. The theme of this series really has been simple. It's called No Other Gospel for a reason. Paul is saying there is no other gospel for us to be saved by. No other gospel but the grace of Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. In Jesus Christ, nothing else. Our works does not save us. Our heritage does not save us. Belonging to the right church does not save us. Avoiding sin does not save us. Uh, keeping all the right things and sacrificing all the right things do not save us. Only Jesus saves us. It's a pretty straightforward theme, and it's really what Paul was getting at, and it's what he birthed these churches in this region on under that gospel. No other gospel, but what was happening is Paul went away, and he begins to hear reports that something else was happening. The church at Galatia was being influenced by false teachers, uh, teachers who were overemphasizing the law. They were coming in saying, you know, Jesus is good, but Jesus isn't good enough. You've you got to do other things. To be a Christian means that you've got to have Jesus plus keep certain laws, plus honor certain traditions, plus do this, plus do that. And Paul is infuriated, and he calls this a perverted gospel. A perverted gospel. In fact, he says in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am astonished at how quickly you are deserting the gospel that I taught you. In other words, he's saying deserting. It's a military term, like switching sides. I'm, I'm, I'm so shocked at how fast you're switching sides. And so these teachers of the law, these teachers, uh, are these what Paul refers to as Judaizers, are really teaching salvation by Jesus plus human effort. Jesus plus rule keeping. Jesus plus checking it off the list. And he says it's a perversion of the gospel. You see, Christianity is not, he, they're turning Christianity into a religion, and no matter what you've heard, or no matter what you've believed or been told, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's trusting in Jesus. And Paul is setting the church straight here, and that's what we've been studying. 
But what's going to happen today is we're going to see Paul use the Jewish people's own history to make a brilliant and effective argument against what they're doing. Because they're saying, listen, you've got to convert to Judaism, be circumcised, and do all these things to to really belong to the lineage of Abraham, to be a child of Abraham. That's a big deal. And so Paul's going to turn this story, he's going to flip this script on him, and he's going to say, you know what, you forget Abraham had two sons, and you're acting like the son of not the one you think you are. And so let me just update you on the story that he's reminding them of. It's the story of Abraham. And Abraham was promised by God to be the father of many nations, to be the, the, have a son. He was promised a son that would, through that son, would be the line of Jesus uh, that we know about, which would save all people. And it would be the birth of all nations and, and, and of many nations. And, and it was a big deal. It was a big promise. And Abraham and his wife Sarah were excited about this promise, so excited that they would leave their home country, do whatever God called them to do right but they're getting a little older and they're actually past well past the childbearing age where this can naturally happen so they begin to doubt God's promise or they think we know what we don't doubt God's promise but maybe God wants us to help him along with the promise because God you know needs our help right and so Sarah goes to Abraham and says okay we're way past the childbearing age and you're supposed to have a son that's going to have all this promises to come along with it so we need to make this happen so here's what we ought to do. You have our maidservant here, our maid, our housemaid, our, our lady Hagar. You have a child with her. She'll be the surrogate here. You have a child with her, a, a son with her, and then, then everything will be okay. And Abraham reluctantly, oh no, it doesn't say he reluctantly, he agreed to this deal. And, and it wasn't a wise decision. He made this choice because they were past the normal uh, ch- child age. So it, as custom of this time, it, wouldn't, it would have been perfectly legal for them to do this, but it was not good according to God's will, according to Genesis 2, 24. So Abraham decided not to wait uh, on God's supernatural actions. Instead, they were going to go through a human attainment. They were going to do what they were capable of doing. And so they have this child through the slave, through the maidservant, and this child's name is Ishmael. And immediately, as you can imagine, like the plot of days of our lives, trouble starts to happen. It doesn't work out. Sarah is jealous, and chaos ensues. And then the miraculous promise of God happens, and Sarah, at a very, very old age, has a child named uh, Isaiah. And so she has this child that is the promise of God, and there's all kinds of conflicts. And these two grow up in conflict with each other. They are at war with each other, so much so that it has carried on down through history. The problems between the Jews and the Arabs still to this day, the problem with so much of the problems today are a direct result of this not waiting on God's promise. And it caused all kinds of feud and problems down through the way. And so Paul says, you know what? You think you are the, of the lineage, you religious leaders think you're of the lineage of Isaac, don't you? Or of, of, of the child of God. But you know what? That's not really true. You're, you're, you're the child of the slave girl. That's what he says, because you didn't wait on God for the problem. You're trying to make it happen. You're trying to make religion God and your human effort. You're not trusting in the promise of Jesus for your salvation. You're trusting in Jesus plus what you can do. He flips the script on him. He says, you are, in fact, not the child of Isaac, descendant of Isaac. You're living this out, and wow, this was an insult to the Judaizers. Paul is implying that, listen, you're not believing in the promise of God alone for your salvation. You're believing in the promise of God plus what you can accomplish, plus human attainment, plus what you can do. And the lesson was clear to the Galatians, and it's clear to us today. You are attempting to fulfill God's promise through fleshly means, through living it out yourself. What, that is what brought, brought about Ishmael, and that's what brought about fight, fighting and strife, and that's what's hurting you today. Paul was saying, you stop believing in God's promises and start believing in the law again after you knew better. And the people are the ones f- putting this on you. The religious leaders are forcing this on you. They're saying, listen, you've got to help accomplish what Jesus wants for your life. Yes, Jesus is good, but you've got to live out that you've got to come to Judaism. And listen. Paul's saying God doesn't need you to accomplish his will and his promise. God doesn't need your potential to do a miracle in your life. Your righteousness is not what brings about your life in God. It is God's righteousness working through you. And this really angers the religious leaders that Paul takes this approach. 
And it angers people still to this day. I mean, I, it's, it's not uncommon. I get stopped by somebody and saying, well, you've got to believe the law. You're say, are you, I just got asked after the last service, are you saying the, that we don't have to believe in the, or we don't have to live out the law? And the point is, no, you're, as we said last week, the law has a purpose, but you don't live it out to save yourself. And so people don't like that because it, it takes away their power or it takes away their ability to feel good about their self. And, and, and the, the lesson is pretty clear here from Paul. Those who trust in God's grace will always be opposed by those seeking salvation from the law every single time those who are trusting in God's grace will constantly always be opposed sometimes in in many cases even persecuted as the apostles were they will be judged they will be challenged and sometimes persecuted by the people who live under the law that's what Paul says in verse 29 but you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Holy Spirit. See what's happening here? And as you look all throughout the Bible and all through human history, this happens. People in positions of power, sometimes even for good uh, reasons, for good intentions, they put regulations and law on person to hold it over them and enables them to feel better about themselves. And that's what religion is in a nutshell. Jesus dealt with this. The religious leaders would say, listen, if you're supposed to stay away from that wall there, they'll, say, they'll make an extra regulation that says you stay 10 feet away from that law. And if you cross that 10 feet, you're sinning. And they did this all throughout the Gospels. You see them challenge Jesus because their holiness, they thought, was based on what they did, not what God did. And we see this still today in, in, in the church. A long history in the church. Maybe you've experienced it. The Bible teaches, for example, the good principle of dressing modestly. And so someone comes along and takes that and they say, we need to get a little more specific with this. So we're going to say women can't wear pants. They must wear dresses to church, and they must wear dresses that go below the knee. If they're not doing that, and they're not keeping the law, and they're sinning. And what starts out maybe with the right intentions of the heart starts causing people to feel guilty, starts getting them to trust in their own self for the salvation, and it gets just exhausting because it's one of two things. Either it's a hardening of heart, or it's a self-righteousness, or, or it's this feeling miserable. Or the Bible says, guard your hearts. A great principle, a great guidance from Jesus, from the Scripture, guard your hearts. So people want to honor that, right? And so what do they do sometimes? Well, they say, okay, that means you can't, have, you can't go to a rated R movie or you can't have a television in your house or you, you can't do this or you can't do that. They start adding to the regulation, the, adding to the idea of guarding your heart, and they start saying, you've got to take it that extra mile. If you don't, it's a sin. Or maybe you have belonged to a church or things where it said, okay, now you've got to follow the religious calendar and you've got to do this and not do this and you've got to give this up and, and, or you're not a good Christian. Or the Bible says things like, don't get drunk. That's a, uh, you know, an instruction in Scripture. So somebody else comes along and says, well, you know what? Uh, we just got to avoid that altogether. So we're going to say it's a sin to drink, and you can't drink at all. And we start writing rules for God. At some point, God says, I did not say that. You're adding to my laws. Now listen, it's fine for parents and for schools to have rules but don't attach those rules to Jesus as a means to how you please him or salvation. It's okay for you to add rules on your family to help your family walk through life and to guide through life. It's a good thing to guide your life that way. But when you look at those rules and you start putting it on person to determine whether they're a Christian or not, whether they're saved or not, or whether you can fellowship with them or not, you are not following what the heart of the grace is about. See, when you look at them and say, you've got to do this and follow Jesus or you're not following Jesus, then that's a problem. And people end up walking away from the rule and unfortunately end up walking away from Jesus even though he had nothing to do with the rule. And we start thinking that we're descendants of Abraham to be a Christian and oftentimes we're descendants of Ishmael. You see, when this happens, we just start feeling overwhelmed and Paul says, listen, don't let this happen get you down. Don't let this discourage you people in the church of uh, Galatia. Live free in grace. In fact, in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, so Christ has truly set you free. He's came to set you free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up in the slavery of the law. 
Paul reminds us that we're truly been set free by Jesus and, 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 and the bondage of having to keep this and keep this and keep this to, to walk in faith. And then verse 2, it says, Listen, I, te- I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision to make you, you're right with God, make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. If you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ and you have fallen away from God's grace. You're abandoning the very thing that's freed you. Because if you're going to count on the law to save you, okay, fine, try it. But guess what? You've got to dot every I and cross every T. And in the Old Testament, there was over 600 rules and regulations about what you could wear and couldn't wear and couldn't eat and couldn't do and where you had to go and where you had to be. There were ceremonial law, sacrifices, rituals, offerings, food restrictions, uh, civil law that told you that guarded the nation of Israel. And then there was the moral law, the Ten Commandments and the things of that. And you had all these 600 laws. And Paul says, if you're going to keep them, fine. If you think you're going to save yourself, you got to keep every last one of them because you break one of them you're gone the wages of one sin broken is death and it's only through the gift of god that we have eternal life paul says it's useless to try to live that way verse 5 says but we who live by the spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness god has promised us for when we place our faith in christ jesus There is no benefit from being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important, listen to this, is faith expressing itself in love. It comes back to faith and love again. Faith and love. In other words, listen, he says, there's no spiritual significance to whether you're circumcised or non-circumcised. And we have to remind ourselves of this in our everyday life, don't we? Martin Luther once said that we got to constantly preach the gospel to ourselves because we're naturally hardwired towards uh, works righteousness. That's the way we're wired, and that's the way religious leaders put it on us. That's the way our society signs. In fact, think about it. Ask the average person, probably even in the church, how do you get to heaven? What determines whether you get to heaven or hell? And the answer, they will say, is by being a good person or by avoiding bad. And they think that that somehow, here's how salvation works. There's these weights, and if your good outweighs your bad, then suddenly you're going to get there. But that's not the way it works. You're lost if you've broken one of those things. And so it's only through Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 7, You were running the race so well. Who has come in and held you back from, from following the truth? It certainly isn't God. In other words, he didn't do this. He's is the one who called you to freedom. God isn't the one putting you in bondage here. The religious leaders are putting you in bondage. You're putting yourself in bondage. People are pushing you to be, and he got so harsh, he said, the people who are pushing you to say you have to be circumcised to be saved, I just wish they would go ahead and just, well, I'm not going to say what he said, because in the Greek language it gets pretty graphic. He's serious about this. He wants Christ followers to stop trying to make the same mistake Abraham and Sarah did. To stop trying to, through human effort, fulfill the promise of God. Only Jesus can do that. That's why the Bible says God made him who had no sin to become your sin so that you in him you might have the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus lived the perfect life that none of us could live. And died the perfect sacrifice so that we can then have his righteousness imputed or put upon us. And there's no way to do that by just trying to live it out. So you say, fair enough, I understand that. I get it, we're saved by grace. So we don't have to live under the law anymore. But does that mean we can live however we want or however we choose? So we just have these liberties to just do whatever now? Is there no? And, and I want to make it very clear here, as, as I, I think we've done throughout this series, Paul makes it very clear when you're in the Spirit of God, that's not your attitude. You don't live those things to be saved, but because you're saved, your whole life's changed, and certainly you're going to love God and love people, and that's going to cover all the Ten Commandments. Paul says this in verse 13, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. 
See what he's saying? You've been set free, but that freedom's not a license to do whatever you want. It's not a license to sin. Now you've got to think, you, you, you're, you're led by the Spirit to, to love God, to try to, 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 to be as much like Him as you can, to love people, to pour His love into others. And when you do that, living faith, all that matters, Paul says, is faith lived out in love. Paul sums it up and says it's love. Because when you love something, do you have to be forced to be a part of it? I mean, I think about this. If you love coming to church, I have a lot of you tell me this first time in your life you love coming to church. You used to have to be drug, you had a drug problem. You had to be drugged to church, right? <laughs> and now you're like, I can't wait to go. I love it. Because you love it, you want to be here. Or think about my son. He loves to go out in the, in the yard and throw baseball with me. He's always, Dad, go throw baseball with me. Go throw baseball with me. He loves it so much, he doesn't have to be made to go throw baseball. He loves it. Or think about romantic love, especially, you know, in those early days. Do you have to, if, if you have a, a teenage son or daughter or granddaughter or grandson that has a girlfriend, or, do you have to make them spend time with them? Do you have to make them want to, to, to treat them well? No, it comes, I mean, that's a natural response to love. And so Paul says, when you love, you want to do what's right. It, it, the motivation changes from I'm doing in order to earn to I'm doing because of what God's done for me. He's given me so much. In verse 16, beginning there, it says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. You'll find that to be true. And the Spirit gives us the desire that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two natures are constantly fighting each other, so are not free to carry out your good intentions. You are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation of the law of Moses. In other words, when we walk by the Spirit, God motivates us in a different way. He doesn't motivate us with the carrot of heaven or the stick of hell. Suddenly, His Spirit in us motivates us to live it out, to flow out of us. It's by pouring in Him and saying, Come, Lord Jesus, be in me. And, you know, start every day, Lord, just let Your Spirit guide me and truly walk in that and see that you've got to understand there are two opposite desires. They're always battling within you. There is a spiritual battle going on inside you. The Holy Spirit wants this. The fleshly desires want this. One person said, there's two natures that beat within my breast. One is foul, one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. You see, Paul lists some things here that are of the sinful nature when we're not walking in the Spirit. A lot of them are sexual sins, uh, lust and, and sexual intimacy. They're, they're all boiled down to any sexual relationship outside the confines of a husband and wife relationship. He says those are the opposite of the spiritual fruit. And then he says there's things like idolatry, which is anything that we put above God, anything we put before God. That can be a job, hobbies, money. It can even be our family, our kids. Then he mentions sorcery and mediums, all those things that we, we should stay away from, black magic, that are the opposite of the Spirit of God. Then he talks about quarrels, he talks about jealousy, he talks about outbursts, he talks about anger, he talks about selfish ambition, he talks about dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, uh, and the other sins, he says. He just, if I hadn't said it yet, here, other sins, you know? And the truth of the matter is, every single one of us in this room at different times in our life struggle with some of the things on that list. It's a pretty inclusive list. And Paul says it's the opposite of what we want from the kingdom of God. But here's the deal. You don't stay away from those things by working hard to stay away from those things. He says, what happens is, you stay away from those things by seeking the Spirit of God. Contrast the, those things with the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives, this kind of fruit. Love, pretty big one. Joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Paul, it's just kind of funny here. He's kind of being tongue-in-cheek. He says, listen, there's no law that makes you do these. When you do these, there's no law that's going to affect you at all because those sum it all up. The, the, the most commentaries remind us that these aren't the fruits of the Spirit. In other words, different fruits that we pick and choose from. But this is the fruit, that, that the consummation of truly following God. When we truly rest in the Spirit of God, when we follow the Spirit of God, then there's this joy in our life. And joy is different than happiness that changes with our circumstances. Joy is this inner such thing that says, no matter what, I know God's got me, this is okay, and it'll be all right in the end. And then there's peace, this, this, this peace that passes all understanding. There's this patience, there's this kindness, there's this goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and, and these self-control, all these things that Paul says, listen, if you rest in the Spirit of God, if you walk in the Spirit of God, if you partner with the Spirit of God daily in your lives, these are the things that will flow out. And then the other things that we listed earlier won't be of any issue to you. And the harder you afford, try to avoid the bad, the harder it is. Like, I mean, you put a, a, paint, a sign up that says wet paint on the wall. I mean, you want to touch the wall. I don't know why. I know why. We're sinful in nature. So, so you're not going to get it by trying to avoid. You're going to get it by instead pouring in to the Spirit of God in you. And you see, God saves you. You do nothing to do with that. But then after say, saving you, there's this partnership that happens where we lean into the Spirit and watch Him walk in life. Paul basically says there's three different approaches you can take here. There's three different approaches to take in this partnership with God. And only one of them leads to life. One that you can take is the legalistic approach. And he's addressed that quite frequently in this book. And the legalistic approach says, you're going to try to do all this and do that and avoid this and do that. And if you do all that, then maybe then you, you might feel momentary satisfaction. But guess what? It won't work because not only will it not get you to closer to God, it'll only change the outside. And the ultimate thing is it'll end one of two ways. Either it'll end with pride, you having this false sense of how good you are when you're really not that good, or it'll end in despair where you think, I'm awful, there's no way I'm going to heaven. And so the legalistic approach doesn't lead to life, it leads to death. Well, then there's the liberty approach, right? Uh, since I'm set free from the law, surely that just means I can live however I want. It's a license to live however you want approach. This is the one the world preaches to you. They say, this will bring you satisfaction. Surely this will get it. This will get it. It will make me happy. And as long as you're happy, that's good. And pleasure is the foundation. But the outcome is quite surprising. The outcome to that is frustration. The outcome to that is destruction. It's just need more. I need more. It didn't satisfy it. King Solomon found that out. He tried all these things. He worked out. And what, you did, what happens, what you understand, is when you pursue pleasure for pleasure's sake, it disappears. It's an elusive thing. The more you seek it, the more it evades you. And you get down the dead-end road, and you become so frustrated, and that's why so many people with everything the world thinks they need ends up giving up in life and, 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 and walking away from life. Because pleasure will not do it. The lib liberty and way, however you want, will not find life. So what way finds life? What approach finds life? Paul makes it pretty clear. It's completely trusting in the Spirit of God. It's completely trusting in the Spirit of God. One preacher compared these three approaches to boats. The first one, the legalistic approach, is like the, it's the rowboat. And you just got to row. If you're going to get anywhere, you got to row. And you might get there, but you're going to be pretty exhausted. You're going to be worn out. You might even get frustrated. And they said, well, the license to live however approach, that's kind of like a cruise, right? You go on a cruise, and it's supposed to be about your pleasure. They're going to take care of you. you got buffets. you got whatever you want. Whatever's going to make you happy that day. If you want to go parasail, and go parasail. Whatever it is, that's what it is. And, and the bottom line is that doesn't work. Only for a moment. Then he compares the completely trusting Christ approach and his spirit approach to the sailboat. Now, I don't know a lot about sailing. I've never done it. But here's what I know about sailing. You don't need an oar. You don't need a motor. 
you don't have a paddle. What gets you where you're going? It's the wind. It's the wind. Kind of neat that Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 8, compares the Holy Spirit to wind. You see, when you're sailing, you're completely dependent on the wind. All you can do is put the sail up. You, you put the sail up. I mean, the distance you go has nothing to do with your effort. And you don't get there and think, boy, wasn't I great. Lou, boy, well, look what I did. I mean, that would be silly. There's no self-reliance in sailing. It's all about the wind. The incredit goes to the wind. The wind is what pushes us along. And that's the Christian life. It's trusting in the Spirit, the wind of God to get you where you're going. And certainly we partner with Him in that. Once we're saved, we have a part to play. We put the cell up and we admit that we need God and we put it up. And and, and we may even steer uh, just a little bit uh, our, our walk with Christ by studying and prayer. But it's mostly all about just trusting the wind. It's not us. We'd be silly to say we got us there. It's all His power, the Spirit of God in us. The same Holy Spirit power that raised Christ from the dead is working in us when we lean into it, when we fall and trust in His grace and we know He is the one that's going to get us there. And suddenly life is not about the legalistic side of doing this and doing that but it's about following the wind and trusting God and that is living that's the gospel that brings life Lee Strobel famous preacher and author, speaker he was for many, many years outside of Christ, lived angry and frustrated and an atheist trying to disprove God. He tells the story of his daughter, Allison. Allison was five years old when, he, when Lee became a follower of Christ. All she had known for the first five years of her life was an angry father, a profane father, a father that one night came home so frustrated he kicked a hole in the living room water just out of the anger with life. He said, I'm ashamed to think about the times Allison went to her room to get away from me. But five months after I gave my life with Christ, he said, Allison, little five-year-old girl, went to her mom and said, Mommy, I want what God, I want God to do for me what God did for Daddy. At five years old, Mommy, I want what, what God I want God to do for me what he's done for daddy. What was she saying? She had never studied the archaeological evidence of Scripture or or the reliability of Scripture. All she knew was this is who her daddy was. Hard to live with. Angry. And this is who her daddy's becoming. This is who he's becoming. And it's as if she was saying, if that's what God does for people, mommy, sign me up. Give me some of that. I hope my kids can feel that way. I hope the people I come in contact with can feel that way. It's not always the case, I'll promise you. But the more we trust in the Spirit of God, the more of the fruit of the Spirit will come in our lives. Maybe you're here today and you say, I'm ready I'm ready for him to do that for me. I want you to know you, you can't do it on your own. You're not meant to do it on your own. Some of you have been trying to get your life right with Christ before you come forward. No, stop. You come forward. You come give your life to Christ and watch him change you. You, you just repent, which means to say, I know, God, you need to change me. And you come to Christ and his power will change you and will walk in you. And then, life happens. Life that will be better than anything you can imagine. Life to its fullest. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for Jesus. So oftentimes, when I get off track in my life, it's when I'm trying to be like Abraham and Sarah, and I'm trying to do it myself, instead of trusting you. May the cross remind us, every single time to stop trusting in ourselves and to trust in you. 
May we understand that it's only by your power, the fact that you broke your body and shed your blood in our place, that we have the righteousness. And then the Holy Spirit is allowed to live in us because of what you did to make us more like you and more like you. Lord, may we never forget that. May we know that. And if anyone's here who needs to find that today, may they come trusting, trusting in your promise. Through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.